Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 21. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Tina. And it's great to be back with everybody again. It's June here in Mississippi, and it's hot this time of year here. Oh, man, it's very hot today. What's it like down there, Peter? Uh, it's winter down here, George, so uh, it's quite chilly at the moment. Wow. Well, we've got a lot to cover in this show, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Peter's bringing us a couple of segments this time around. Uh, one is a recent uh, conference that he attended, and the other is a tour of the Australian Signals Museum, and that, that's going to be interesting, Peter. Yes, it's, uh, it's look, this, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, our viewers will enjoy the uh, Signals Museum. It, uh, it, it, I had a wonderful time, and I actually had to cut the footage down from 60 minutes down to two 15-minute segments, and it was so hard to do, I can tell you. <laughs> tell me, what have you got this episode? Well, I had a revisit back to the photo tips type segment uh you know some people have been asking about the possibility of submitting some video to mm -hmm. amateurlogic.tv and i did a segment on a uh, high level overview of file formats and some do's and don'ts and prepping your video to send in cool yeah we'll be glad to see some video for some folks maybe this will uh spur a few of them on to yeah get us uh, a little bit yeah i hope so and i covered the uh, mfj 259b antenna analyzer this episode, uh, which is quite an interesting little piece of test gear. Well, let's get into our emails here. First, I've got one from an old college buddy of mine. This is from Mike, W5MKO. He says, I just stumbled across your website, and it's not only entertaining, but also informative. And I believe it's a significant method of attracting new hams to the hobby. Our compliments to you all. And on that same note, I got an email from Thomas, KJ4DZM, he said, your show inspired me to take the technician exam. I passed, but have not been on the air yet. I'm saving my money for a Kenwood THF6A. So now I'm listening to 80 meter sideband on my DX150A. He said, I saw a new movie, The Strangers, and there was a girl calling for help on a ham radio, and I heard the call K5PXZ. So I looked it up on the ARRL database, and uh, no luck. He said, I was wondering if any of your viewers uh, heard the same call letters, and I, I want to know if that's fake or uh, is that a real call. Okay, Thomas, uh, maybe someone out there uh, did hear it, and uh, will write in and let us know about that. Tommy, have you got an email there? Yeah, I do. Uh, another one along the photo, t uh, photo tip line. I've had quite a few about photo tips. Cool. Anyway, um, I've got one from John, N3, DRH. He says, I like your digital imaging segments. Everyone's waiting for the next episode. I have a method of testing the amount of red noise, red as an READ, in the analog to digital converter and digital cameras. <clears throat> it is the other type of noise that camera manufacturers have some control over. The faster the image is digitized, the more red noise is generally. Have you seen a discussion or on measurements of red noise? And no, John, I haven't. Um, that's something that's pretty interesting to me. That's one of the reasons why in the previous uh, uh, photo tip segments that I mentioned shooting raw, uh, it's to minimize the noise and also low ISO. And uh, I did a little bit of research on that, and I found some stuff, and I may present a photo tip segment on this very thing in the future. Is that red noise or read noise? Well, there's a past tense or... <laughs> Present tense. It's R E A D. Okay. <laughs> I've got an email here from Scott uh, N Seven C T F. Uh, Scott's a ham in Northeast Montana, USA, at Fort Peck. Uh, he enjoys our video magazine very much. Thanks, Scott. And uh, he called the issue about the Deegan D E eleven O three shortwave radio, and says that it looks like quite a radio. Uh, may I ask which seller you used in your purchase? Funnily enough, uh, I still have my radio, and uh, I actually use it during filming to uh, receive the uh, audio uh, on from Skype, and it's it's going great. I absolutely love it. Uh, the um, uh, I. I should say we don't endorse any particular seller uh, here at Amateur Logic, but I did use one called TQU China, TQU China, and uh, I had no problems there. Just one thing, when making eBay purchases, uh, I just recommend that you go and have a look at the feedback and look at it very carefully. 
and uh, you know make sure that the person you're dealing with uh, has had at least a hundred transactions before and they've got a very very uh, high rating unfortunately some of the Chinese sellers what they'll do is they'll actually go out and they'll buy a number of one cent items and uh, these one cent items uh, actually give them automatic good feedback and it's like a it's a backdoor way of actually buying good feedback and so uh, you want to avoid those kind of um, uh, people I uh, hope that helps uh, some viewers out there. Just one other thing also uh, about Scott's email. Uh, he has a webcam at his webpage uh, www.sunlightdreams.com. He's got some quite, uh, uh, quite good photos there uh, from his webcam of some deer. And uh, looks, uh, Fort Peck looks like a really nice place there, Scott. Peter, you visited with an old friend of ours recently, didn't you? Yes, so uh, Robert Broomhead, uh, who you might remember from, I think, episode 14. Uh, I'm not sure the exact number, but uh, Robert uh, gave me a bit of an update about the foundation license. And, uh, well, it was a short little interview, so here it is. Well, hello, everyone. Now, I'm joined today by Robert Broomhead from the Wireless Institute of Australia. Uh, welcome, Robert. G'day, Peter. How are you? Now, uh, Robert's going to tell us uh, a little bit of updated news about the Foundation Licence Manual, which the WIA sell. Uh, since uh, we last spoke, uh, uh, Robert, how many uh, copies of the Foundation Licence Manual has the WIA sold? Well, the first run of the manuals that we did, um, this is just a couple of years ago, we did 5,000 of those manuals. So we've, we've sold all 5,000. We sold completely out of the 5,000 manuals that we produced. And as you know, there's what well over 2,000 new uh, entrants into the hobby because of that. So. Well, it might be another 3,000 potential entrants uh, who haven't set their exams yeah. as yet. But uh, you've actually got a new version, though, of the manual, haven't you? That's right. Yeah, we've just released the second edition of the manual. So it's the same, it's the same manual as the first one, but we've improved it. We've uh, increased it from 96 to 108 pages of uh, useful information. Uh, needless to say, uh, you've added in extra information. What uh, what's new and what's what's added in that wasn't in the first edition? Yeah, well, we've got a section in the back here about, uh, uh, for example, about um, propagation. One of the and uh, one of the things that well, certainly uh, when I first got my license too, I remember getting my first HF radio and uh, turning it on and being a little bit uh, disappointed that I kept on turning it on at the same time of the day and could never ever hear anything. So this section here on uh, HF propagation is going to be pretty invaluable to the new guys to get started. I wish I'd had that. Well, it's very useful because uh, one of the the first things you learn as a shortwave listener yeah. uh, is that uh, at certain times of the day, uh, you know, if you, if you pick the wrong band, you're not going to hear very much at all. But, uh, okay, well, I suppose the final question is um, uh, what does it cost and where do you get it? Uh, it's twenty four fifty to non-members mm -hmm. or if you're a member of our organisation, Organization, the Wireless Institute, it's 1950, and you can buy it through the WIA's online bookshop, which is on the internet, www.wia.org.au. Okay, well, so if uh, uh, if you're uh, interested in getting a foundation licence here in uh, in Australia, uh, this book is uh, well worth checking out. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, I've discussed on air uh, uh, the possibility or the idea of actually having a foundation licence in America. Uh, the idea doesn't appear to have been taken off, but uh, I reckon if, uh, if they did establish a foundation licence, uh, you could sell a, a million of those things. <laughs> yeah, <we're laughs> yeah. Look, it's, it's been worth its weight in gold. We've turned the hobby around in Australia from being a declining hobby to a growth hobby. Yeah. So, yeah. Really so something for our overseas cousins to, uh, uh, to consider. OK, thanks very much, Robert. Thanks, Peter, for catching Cheers. up with us. Cheers. OK, bye. bye. Well, Peter, it's good to see Robert again. What else did you see at Broken Hill? Well, uh, yeah, I should explain to the viewers, uh, I went uh, up to uh, Broken Hill to uh, the Wireless Institute of Australia annual, annual general meeting, uh, which is now being held in generally in a remote or rural lo location and accompanied by a number of radio-related tours every year. It's becoming an annual event, and uh, I, this year I, I headed up there along with a number of fellow amateurs and uh, had an absolutely great time. Uh, I actually have some footage from uh, that trip, a sort of highlights package which I'd like to show you. So here it is. On the weekend of the 24th and 25th of May 2008, over 100 Wireless Institute of Australia members from all over Australia, including myself, made the long trip to Broken Hill in far western New South Wales for the WIA Annual General Meeting. 
Broken Hill is a mining town with some of the world's richest deposits of silver, lead and zinc. It's a beautiful town with a rich and varied history. It's also home to a thriving arts community. The WIA arranged a number of activities for members visiting Broken Hill. The first of these was a tour of the School of the Air. Until June 1951, young students on remote homesteads did their school lessons by correspondence. The first School of the Air was established in Alice Springs on the 8th of June 1951, and Broken Hills School of the Air opened in 1955. The school used HF radios for teachers based in Broken Hill to deliver lessons to young students on remote cattle and sheep stations. In 2003, the Broken Hill School of the Air moved to satellite internet technology. Students can now not only talk with their teachers, but they can see their teacher on their computer screens. The internet links delivered by this system enable internet access, file sharing and email. However, due to bandwidth constraints, teachers cannot see the students. Those HF radios on remote stations also had another important use. In 1928, the Reverend John Flynn established an aerial medical service later known as the Royal Flying Doctor Service. This service still delivers emergency medical aid and comprehensive health care to remote homesteads and travellers in remote areas using a fleet of aircraft at a number of locations in outback Australia. One great invention that facilitated the use of radio in remote areas for medical and other purposes was Alf Tragar's invention of the pedal radio. A pedal crank generator provided power for a HF radio to work. Radio in the outback also eased the loneliness felt by those living in remote areas by providing a means of social communication. More recently, HF radio in the outback is being displaced by satellite telephony and now less than 2% of all medical requests for assistance with the RFDS come via HF radio. The WIA also organised tours of local radio station 2BH. The station is unusual in that its building is built in the style and shape of an old mantle radio. There were also a number of formal and informal breakfasts and dinners, including talks by former mayor of Broken Hill, Peter Black, and painter, Jack Absalom. I also spent some time looking at Broken Hill's artworks, the nearby ghost town of Silverton, and also testing out my newly constructed Aussie pole on a few occasions. I found I could get consistent 5x7 reports on 40 metres into Nowra on the New South Wales east coast and Lancefield in central Victoria. The antenna worked quite well. The practice of holding the WIA's AGM in a remote location with interesting radio related tours is a comparatively new initiative. Last year the AGM was held in Parks, New South Wales and included a tour of the Parks radio telescope as featured in the film The Dish. By all accounts, both that AGM and this year's AGM in Broken Hill have proved to be great successes. I can't wait to see where next year's AGM is to be held. That was great, Peter. Um, the School of the Air, that's not what I would have expected. Uh, we don't have anything like that here, but I could see where it would be a big benefit in Australia. Absolutely, George. And, you know, one of the most interesting things that I found was that, in fact, the School of the Year is actually expanding, uh, would you believe? Uh, with the technology they've got now, they can actually conduct interviews from one side of the country to another, or even internationally, you know, pretty much the same way as we do with Skype. And they're finding that they can actually use these distance education services for uh, uh, children in... Uh, within the cities, perhaps kids that for whatever reason can't actually, uh, shall we say, function in a, a normal school environment. Uh, they're not, uh, not terribly social or uh, uh, may have, uh, they might be bedridden or some other problem like that. So this enables them to actually get an education from home uh, in a city environment as well. So uh, it's a fantastic technology and uh, uh, it, it can only get better. Yeah, the Aussie pole looks pretty interesting. 
The Aussie pole, yes, I've uh, certainly uh, taken that out and uh, given it a, a good spin now. I was able to get uh, five by seven reports from Broken Hill uh, into uh, central Victoria and also the eastern uh, states, uh, sorry, the eastern coast of New South Wales. Both of those were on uh, 40 metres. It's quite a good little antenna. The only uh, rider or a qualification I would put on it is that it's actually fairly delicate. Um, it has telescopic antennas at either end and you know you wouldn't want to have that fall on the ground because they would break quite easily but as a, a portable lightweight antenna uh, it's great and I hope in a future episode to actually show you how I built and constructed that it's very very easy to build and uh, I might as well mention that uh, it's available as a kit from the mid north the, the mid north coast amateur radio group uh, in uh, central New South Wales very cool looks like a, a great little project for portable Let's get back to the emails. I've got one here from Mike K5HUM. They said, great show. I've learned many new and useful things. We share some similar backgrounds. I was also a broadcast engineer at WDSU TV in New Orleans many years ago. And he says, I see your QTH is north of Jackson, Mississippi. I'm about 12 miles north of Picayune, which that's down mm -hmm. in the southern part of the state. Mm -hmm. He said, I noticed from time to time that you tout uh, products on the show of interest, you know, to hams and the general public. He said, I'm an author of a freeware peer-to-peer -peer text client called PopNote. Cool. You heard of that? No, I haven't. I, I've heard of it before, but I've never used it. He said, I originally created it for my own needs, but other hams have discovered it as well, and it's a useful side channel medium for their voiceover IP activities on the net. I would appreciate a plug. There you go. There you go, You're Mike. You're plugged. <laughs> You've been plugged. <laughs> Here's the address where you can uh, find out more about PopNote. Yeah, I'm going to try it. I'm going to check that out. Have cool. you tried it? I haven't, no. Cool. Um, I got an email here from Dennis, KK0DJ. Uh, Dennis says, I just watched your segment on AmateurLogic.tv regarding the website and repeaters. He said, that rocks. I stumbled onto AmateurLogic.tv through eham.net and have been enjoying it. Th um, excuse me, enjoying going through all of your current postings. Just out of curiosity, is there a show about how you fellows got started in putting this together? I sure enjoy it. Thanks for the offering. Well, Dennis, I, th I believe we actually had something in episode number one about that, didn't Was we? Was it in number one? I don't think. <clears throat> it's in one or two. Um, it's one of the early ones. Yeah, yeah it's in episode two. Okay. And uh, if you go back and watch episode two, you should see how George, Jimmy, and myself got started. Yeah. And um, we ran into our friend Peter. He was a viewer, sent us some emails, and showed some mm -hmm. interest. And uh, we were glad to bring Peter on board as well. He's been a, a big asset to the show. Yeah. Well, thank you. Speaking of that, Peter, please read another email for us. Uh, glad to there, George. Um, we've got an email here from uh, John. Uh, he doesn't give his call sign, but uh, he says, Thanks to Tim, KC9DNN, for this marvellous video ham site. So obviously Tim's given him a, a tip of where to find it. Thanks, Tim. I learn something every day. These guys are terrific, and I particularly enjoyed the episode 16 interview with Martin F. Jew of MFJ Enterprises. We did too. Also enjoyed seeing Cash Olsen's hot air surface mount technique in episode 15. I met Cash here in Austin at Summerfest and was very impressed by this technique. A lot of AQR peers have those embossing air blowers. $10 on sale, and they are great for removing chips too. These are the longest YouTube videos I've seen. I thought you were limited to four or five minutes, but you can slide over to the part of the episode that you want if you don't have 55 minutes to spare. And uh, yes, you're quite right, uh, John, but you might be interested uh, to know that uh, in fact these days uh, YouTube videos are actually limited to 10 minutes. Uh, it's only some of the older producers like uh, George here that uh, can still put up uh, the, uh, the longer uh, episodes. So we're rather fortunate that uh, George got in while the going was good. There's a uh, particular type of account you can sign up for. It, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe director's account. Something like that. And that's what we did to allow us to put the longer videos on there. But we're still limited to 100 megabytes. Yeah. So that means, um, you know, these things have got to be cut down before we can put them on there compression-wise. 
So the quality of the YouTube uh, presentation is not quite as good as what you would download direct from the yeah, website. Yeah, it's, it's not nearly as, as clean. Well, true, yeah. So if you really want to see us in all our glory, <laughs> go download the H.264 version and watch it with QuickTime. I've got another email here from another broadcaster. You know, there's a lot of uh, broadcasters in amateur radio, and apparently a few of them are fine on the show. It kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. This is from uh, Charlie, KY5U. He says, love the videos. Didn't realize you lived near Jackson. I'm also a former broadcast transmitter engineer for AM from the 60s and 70s. Now I'm network director for the state of Mississippi for AT&T Mobility. Keep up the great work and hope to meet you again. Well, I think I'll save that one for future reference in case I have any problems yeah. with my phone. Get your cell phone doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one from our friend Greg. He says, I'm Greg from next door to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Sharon Hill. I was thinking it might be a good idea to speak on NICAD, nickel metal hydride, and lithium ion batteries. I've just seen uh, episode number one through seven, so maybe you cover cover it later. Um, possibly, could you even speak about deep cycle batteries and how to test, use, and charge them, or best use and charge them? Uh, basically, I learned about AA nickel metal hydride batteries when I got my Olympus digital camera over five years ago. Having power redundancy while I was in South America and Asia caused me to look at the easy way to get power during power outages. My latest toy is a six volt 7 amp rechargeable LED lantern with a lead acid battery. It charges with 12 volts and 110 volts and a secret trap door in the base so you won't lose them. I think part of my email got chopped off there. <laughs> anyway, uh, the batteries are a great idea, Greg. Um, I've got some battery devices I actually found on the clearance rack I thought were pretty interesting. I may do uh, a uh, segment, or hopefully, hopefully one of us maybe do one in the near future about al alternate power again, like we did near the yeah. beginning. I think some things have changed. Maybe time to revisit that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a great idea. Thanks for writing, Tommy. Tell us a little more about the segment you've got for us this month. Well, <clears throat> you know, we've had some people ask about um, possibility of submitting some video to use on the show, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we try to maintain pretty high quality in our production, mm -hmm. and so I thought maybe it might be a good idea to put a little something together and give people, steer them in the right direction about file formats and some transitions and some few things. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to it. There's, you know, you can only cram so much into a yeah. segment time. So it's a, it's a pretty high overview and I hope to get some emails to go into depth more. And uh, if there's a good response to it, maybe zoom in on some, some critical areas. But anyway, hopefully people will watch this and, and help them get started to submit some video. Hi, I'm Tommy. Well, the last few months we've had a few requests about the possibility of people sending in some segments, um, some footage to include in AmateurLogic.tv. Well, we're certainly open to the idea of that, and uh, I'd like to take a few minutes. It's only so much I can cover in a 10-minute segment, but hopefully this should give you a high-level view of the type of file formats that we prefer to accept and so forth and um, anyway get you well on your way if you do want to submit something we all use 3 CD Panasonic cameras while that's not to say that's all we would will accept you know we prefer the video to be good quality uh, decent lighting and clear um, certain file formats as I said if you submit it we prefer it to be pretty well uh, pre-canned and usable before you send it. While we don't mind doing some minor editing, you know, we don't, really don't prefer not to, have to spend a whole lot of time on editing your segment. Okay, the software we're going to use for our video editing is Adobe Premiere Elements. I happen to be using version 4, um, upgraded because I have a one Vista PC. George and the guys are still on 3. They're both very capable, um, do pretty much the same things. Uh, also, Premiere Elements is uh, by any means the only editor that you can use to submit footage for AmateurLogic.tv. Um, as long as it'll output uh, DV format or uh, H.264 or a DV format and you can compress the H.264 with another software package like QuickTime, then that's fine. Um, let's start off with a new project 
and I'm going to take advantage of some video clips that I've already captured just for the sake of brevity. Um, <clears throat> we'll go over to the file system and select there it comes up here go over to the file system and get the media that we want and I'm just going to select all of these clips that I, that I created when I was doing the ATAS 120A antenna segment in episode 16. If you look at the file names you'll notice that they're the file name that I gave it with a space and a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 all the way up through 14. What that is is that's how many times I started and stopped the camera when I was shooting. When you go through the capture menu on uh, Premiere Elements, you can ha tell it, and actually it's on by default, to split the files into different file names every time you started and stopped the camera. That That's really what I would recommend you do. It makes things a lot more manageable, but you won't have a huge file with a lot of takes that you want to throw away. Um, I'll go ahead and add all of these to my project. You can see as they get added, you can see a thumbnail um, of what's in each one of them. Um, go over to the project view, and because I know uh, I've edited this video before, I know that uh, clip number six is the one I start out with, where I was satisfied with how it started. Um, nothing goes perfect the first take, as you can see. I did. Uh, I shot some B-roll footage first, the the antenna mount, and well, you can't tell it. This is me holding the antenna, showing where it connect actually connects to the mount, things like that. This is where I actually started talking on the video, and I messed up the first two. Uh, clip number six is the one where I was actually useful, so I'll drag that to my timeline. You can slide the marker back and forth and view your video clip. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. You can trim the uh, video. Say you've got, I don't know, if you're scratching your head or something at the beginning, you can get to the point. Actually, there you go. That's where I clapped to signal the beginning of my video. So I don't want that in there. Let's move the marker to just past it. And we'll go over here and click the scissors, the split clip tool. It'll actually separate that piece of video will select it, hit the delete button, and it'll close up the gap. And now you can see that it's not there any longer. Um, norm this is going to be an oversimplified demonstration because normally there, there would be 12 or 15 different pieces of video. Um, we'll do that and then we'll go over it and add the video of the antenna where I showed the, how the speed of the antenna going up and down. We'll drag it to the timeline as well and uh, go to where they're joined and if we play that you'll see that that it just jumps from one video clip to the other um, we can take care of that and make it a lot more pleasing by using the transition most video editors have something similar to this and most of them are actually called transition I tend to like the dip to black one myself and we'll just take that and drag it in between the two video clips here. Zoom in a little bit so we can see it. And we'll double click on that. Actually, we need to zoom in a little more. We'll double click on that transition and see the duration of it. Um, all the little details like that uh, make the difference in how your video appears to a viewer. Let's look at the how long it takes for that to fade takes pretty well one second. It actually is one second because if we look at that it, it shows it. I like it at uh, about one tenth or one fifteenth. So we'll, we'll stop it on one fifteenth right there. And let's go back and view it again. And now we have a transition. It doesn't take too long. It's not distracting. It goes right into the next video clip. I would suggest doing transitions in between your videos where it makes sense. Um, another thing that you'll see that we do is at, near the end we usually show a link to the show or email addresses so forth and we have some uh, predefined ones that we use. If you use this package we'd be glad to send you uh, the title or you can create your own using the title tool in your software package. 
Well, again, for the sake of brevity, I'll use this one, which has a has a pretty well pretty bogus link in it to start with, and we'll edit that and take it out. Let's move our timeline marker over here, and you can see uh, what happens. I drug that up on another video track, and this will allow me to show two pieces of video or two items at one time. As you can see, I have a transparent background and then a link. Well, I certainly don't like the Outdoors link on there. So let's double click on this and we'll go in and edit the uh, the text. And let's center it up a little bit so it looks nice. we can go back and look at it on our timeline you can if you wanted to trend to do a transition on those you could do them as well but I normally don't do them um, you can add a transition and have it crossfade where it goes in smooth so many things that you can do to uh, dress up your video I'm gonna take that one back out like I say I don't normally do them so many different things you can do to dress up your video and make it look very professional. Um, the key thing, after you get all this laid out like you want it, watch it from the beginning. I would suggest watching at least a couple of times to make sure you don't have any mistakes. And then we need to render it out into a final file. To do that in this package, we'll click on File, Export, and we'll go to Movie. And I always double check my settings. This package retains most of the settings that you did before. I don't want to add that to my project. Let's look at video. Uh, DV, NTSC, and 720 by 480 are the main things that you want to uh, to shoot for. Depending on the length of your clip, a DV file can be quite large. So um, anyway, let's always start out with that, and then if I need to upload it, I'll use another tool and compress it. But this gives you your best quality, and it's still somewhat compressed. Um, I'll deinterlace this one so it doesn't have that look, that uh, the line look on it. Sometimes you'll see in some uh, video from home home video cameras, and my audio settings are good. I'm click OK, and we'll give it a file name. Click Save, and it'll sit there and, and uh, render out. Now this can be quite a slow process. I think, depending on the the segment or the show, actually, it uh, takes probably five or six hours to render out the entire 45 minutes to an hour uh, Amateur Logic TV show every month. After that happens, we have to go back through and compress again to make the final file. We start with the master, that's a DV file, and then we'll use QuickTime and uh, Windows Media Encoder and actually create the versions that you're downloading. Well, you can see it's not that hard for the most part. Um, the main thing is pay attention to the details. Um, try to watch your lighting. Make sure that if you send the, something in, send it in the right format. Uh, Mini DV is the best. H264, second best. I used Adobe Premiere Elements. That's not the only software that you could use, but I would suggest probably shy away from the Windows Movie Maker software because it only outputs uh, WMV video files, and we would have to convert those into something else to be able to import them into our software to include them in the production, and there's a lot of quality loss when you do the conversions like that. Um, I only had about 15 minutes to create for my time slot here so there's only so much you can cover if you have questions feel free to let me know I'll probably do a few more of these somewhere in the future and maybe actually zoom in on on an area and go into a lot more detail about that uh, if you have any requests for that send me a message uh, an email tmartin at amateurlogic.tv or like always if you have any any questions send me an email and I'll be glad to do the best I can to answer them that was a great video, uh, Tommy. How would people get uh, videos uploaded to you? Thanks. Well, they can either send in a DVD, just email, and we can send an address that they can send it to, or um, depending on the size of it, 
Uh, if they compress it with H.264, we can probably set up a, a quick account on the FTP site and they can upload it to us. But sure. uh, they need to make arrangements ahead of time for that. Yeah. And and we encourage everyone once again, you know, get the camera out there, show us what you're doing. <laughs> we have trouble coming up with content every month. Yeah. Um, well, let's go back to Peter for one more email. Sure. I got a, an email here from Fitzy. He writes... Tommy, Jimmy and Peter. Well, um, Jimmy's left the building, not literally though. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's uh, uh, moved on but uh, uh, and, and we do miss him. But uh, I'll continue. Uh, I want to thank you for your interesting show on shortwave radio. I've watched two episodes and wow, I really like that and I'm planning on watching all the rest on Google Video. Uh, I just don't know how I've missed your videos for so long since you've been broadcasting since 2005, as I can see. I've been scouring the web for videos that would cover such topics, and I must say yours are the best and for free. Thanks again, and keep up the good work, Fitzy. Well, thanks, Fitzy. Uh, it's interesting, I found Amateur Logic in exactly the same way. Uh, I was searching for video to put up on my local ATV repeater, and that's how I came to know the guys in Mississippi. Uh, we're glad that you're watching us on Google Video, but you can get much better quality downloads uh, at our website, www.amateurlogic.com. Uh, also, whilst looking through the statistics of how many people have downloaded each episode, it's interesting that uh, some of the earlier episodes have actually had relatively few downloads. So I'd encourage uh, people out there to actually go back and, for example, episode 6, which has had, uh, let's see, uh, 1,149 YouTube downloads, as against episode 10, which has had 15,461 downloads. There's nothing wrong with episode 6. I, I watched it last night and it's certainly not dull. So uh, I'd encourage people to go back and look at those uh, earlier episodes if you haven't seen them because they are great viewing. Yeah, we would encourage everyone to go back. There's uh, something a little different in every show and, and as Peter pointed out, some of the shows got blogged on some uh, websites around mm -hmm. and got quite a bit of uh, viewership and others didn't. So, yeah, uh, there, a lot of them had content that targeted different audience. The yeah. the Wi-Fi things uh, oh, those seem have, to be very yeah, popular. A lot, a lot of downloads. Well, recently I got a new little toy here. Uh, my friend uh, Richard Stubbs at uh, MFJ Enterprises turned me on to this antenna analyzer. I want to show you a little bit about it. In this episode's From the Bench segment, we're going to talk about measuring the VSWR, or reflected power, on your antenna system. Traditionally, amateur radio operators would use a device like this, a SWR meter, to measure the forward and reflected power of their antenna system. You know, you want to minimize reflected power because any reflected power is power that did not make it to the antenna and could also be heating up your transmission line and connectors on the way to the antenna. So you definitely want to minimize that to get the best performance from your antenna system, not to mention uh, to avoid the possibility of damaging your radio. Older radios did not have uh, VSWR protection, so this means if you ran too high of reflected power, you run the risk of burning out the finals in your radio. Many newer radios have the option on some, some it's built in by default, that will automatically fold back the power or turn it down as the reflected power increases. Regardless, you still want to operate with the lowest reflected power that you can. Now we're going to be looking at a device that I picked up at the Hamfest a couple of months back. It's the MFJ259B antenna analyzer. The MFJ antenna analyzer contains four basic circuits. A 1.8 to 170 megahertz variable frequency oscillator, a frequency counter, a 50 ohm RF bridge, and an 8-bit microcontroller to run the whole rig. The antenna analyzer does a lot more than the name would imply. You can measure cable length in feet, cable loss in dB, capacitance in picofarads, impedance or Z magnitude in ohms, impedance phase in degrees, inductance in microhenries, reactance or X in ohms, resistance or what's commonly called R in ohms, resonance in megahertz, return loss in dB, frequency in megahertz, and SWR as reference to 50 ohms. 
Typical uses for the antenna analyzer are to measure antenna SWR, impedance, reactance, resistance, resonant frequency, and bandwidth. It can also measure antenna tuners SWR, bandwidth, and frequency. For amplifiers, you can measure input and output matching networks, chokes, suppressors, traps, and components. Coaxial transmission line measurements include SWR, length, velocity factor, the approximate Q and loss, resonance frequency, and impedance. And for filters, you can measure SWR, attenuation, and the frequency range. For matching or tuning stubs, you can measure SWR, the approximate Q, resonant frequency, bandwidth, and impedance. For traps, you can measure the resonant frequency and the approximate Q. Same for tuned circuits, you can measure their resonant frequency and their approximate Q. Small capacitors, you can measure their value and their self-resonant frequency. The unit won't measure larger electrolytic capacitors, but those aren't typically used in RF circuits anyway. For RF chokes and inductors, you can measure the self-resonance, the series resonance, and the value. And for transmitters and oscillators, the unit has a built-in frequency counter as well. Power to the antenna analyzer is supplied by 10 internal AA batteries. These can either be uh, alkaline batteries or they can be rechargeable batteries. If you do choose rechargeable batteries, there's a jumper inside the unit that you set to allow the batteries to recharge whenever external power is applied. There's also an external power connector on top of the unit where you can feed it anywhere between 11 and 16 volts of external power. This can be from an AC adapter or an external battery. Located from left to right, you'll see a ground terminal, which is useful and necessary when connecting to antenna systems that work against earth ground. You'll see the antenna input, which is a PL259. They also include a versatile banana jack that can be used. Next to that is the BNC connector for the frequency counter input and of course the power connector. Located on the front of the unit are the power button, the SWR meter, the impedance meter, the gate control, the mode control, the tuning frequency for the built-in oscillator, and the frequency range of the built-in oscillator. To operate the unit, you turn it on, then select what mode you want. It's currently in impedance mode. You can select through to coax loss, capacitance, inductance, frequency counter, and back to impedance. On impedance, the unit shows us the frequency the oscillator is tuned to in megahertz. It also shows us the resistance, the reactance, and the SWR. Now using the gate control in this mode, will also allow you to see the uh, phase angle of the impedance. Now I have here a 50 ohm dummy load that I purchased some years ago at a ham fest. It's 100 watts made by Philco, an excellent deal. It says that it's 50 ohms on the tag on the unit. But let's see what the ohm meter says. The ohm meter calls it 56.4 ohms. Now that's DC resistance, which is not the same as impedance or the RF resistance of the unit because we're just using a battery and DC voltage here to measure it with an ohm meter. When we're using an antenna analyzer or a transmitter, you're actually interested in the AC resistance at the frequency of operation. Now we'll connect the dummy load to the antenna analyzer. And one word of caution when you're connecting to the antenna input of the analyzer, is to be certain you never put anything with voltage into that point or you'll damage the analyzer. You don't want any uh, voltage or RF going into this jack. You only want uh, antenna. And you w really wouldn't want uh, high RF in the vicinity of the antenna as that could come into the unit and damage it as well. Now the antenna analyzer shows that our dummy load is 40 ohms resistance and 6 ohms of reactance with the SWR of 1.2. So that's quite a different story. This is at 170.93 megahertz. And as we move on down to the bottom scale, 4.2 megahertz, resistance is 56, reactance is toggling between 0 and 2, 
and it's a 1.1 VSWR. Now if we adjust the tune control to move it uh, on into the 80 meter band, we find that it holds pretty steady. It's not changing much. So by changing the different bands on the unit here, we can determine the bandwidth of the dummy load and we see that it's it's probably going to be okay for anything we'd want to use it for because the reflected power or the VSWR never went above 1.2. This is my mobile antenna. It is an Outbacker Junior and if you look at it close you'll see that there are taps on it for the various bands that you might want to tune this antenna to. I'm going to adjust it here on 80 meters, which means that there's no um, tap or wire put on it. It's just a straight antenna. And if you look at the very top, there's the stinger right there, and a neural node at the bottom of it where you adjust the actual antenna resonant frequency. So we'll start out by tuning the analyzer on the 80 meter band here to find the dip in the reflected power or the SWR on this antenna. There appears to be a dip. We have a SWR of 1.4 at 3840. And actually I want to tune this antenna to be on 3850. So let's make a couple of adjustments. Okay, we're still not there. The reflected power is 1.7 at 3850, so let's make another adjustment. And as you can see here, I've adjusted the antenna. I'm re-nulling the SWR reading on the meter. And at 38.49 megahertz, approximately 38.50, I've got an SWR of 1.4, which is as good as I'm going to get on this antenna. Now in the past, I've used uh, professional gear on AM stations like Atomic Instruments synthesizer detector, which is an uh, oscillator and a receiver. And I've used a Delta operating impedance bridge, and that's well over $10,000 worth of gear. This little MFJ unit at $289.95 is <laughs> quite a bit more reasonable. Uh, this unit uh, does HF and VHF, and they also have another model that's $389.95 that uh, does UHF as well. And they have models down as low as $99 that have different feature sets. This one right here hits the, um, the middle of the field for me. It tells me what I want to know. It shows me the SWR, it shows me the resistance and reactance of the antenna, which is important uh, when you're designing antennas. So if you're looking for a better way than just using an SWR meter to see what's going on with the antenna, can't do better than this. And that's a cool device. What yeah. else have you done with it? Well, I've done a number of things, uh, antenna projects with it. Um, I built an all-center fed dipole for 40 meters, similar to the one you have for 80 meters. Yeah. And I, I did quite a bit of plotting and testing on that just to see exactly how the antenna was going to perform on the various bands. And I'll show you a little bit of that in a future segment. Yeah, that's a really sweet device. Oh, it is. It really is. Well, I've got another email here. Uh, this one's from Brian, KE7MMU. I was recently introduced to your webcast through N0HR website. Spent several hours at work, working the night shift, of course watching all your episodes. I was interested in episode 19. One of the seminar speakers, Andy Anderson, mentioned a keyboard and sending Morse code. Uh, could you explain more about that? I want to learn Morse code. I think it could be a benefit to me. And I'm a computer techie, so I have the hardware knowledge. Well, Brian, um, you know, I don't really know exactly what Andy was talking about there, what device it was, and I don't know how to get in contact with him since his email address is not on QRZ. Yeah. 
Yeah, but he, I think he watches the show, so maybe he'll see yeah. it and be able to send something in cool. about it. Yeah, maybe he will. If he does, we can pass it on. Yeah, Andy, send us uh, an email on this. Uh, anyway, you know, for sending uh, Morse code with the keyboard, I use uh, Digital Master 780, which is part of the Ham Radio Deluxe package that Tommy reviewed several episodes back. And uh, you can send uh, CW right from your keyboard and a computer with that. Or also... Uh, some time back, I saw a basic stamp project that uh, was just exactly that. You added some other components to it, and you could plug in a keyboard and send CW. Oh, do I see a, a episode in the making? Uh, possibly, the segment? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got one more email there, Tommy? Yeah, actually, I have one from our friend Scott in uh, Montana as well. It says, I've been trying to remember which episode of Amateur Logic TV had the little item of about the motorized HF antennas that slide up and down. Was it a high Sierra brand? Can you let me know which episode that was? I, I sure enjoy your broadcast, and especially the comic stunts that Jimmy pulls off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wish, he wish he'd come to our field day. You all are doing a great job. Sincerely, Scott. Uh, in 7 ctf Thanks, Scott. And uh, that was actually in episode 16, and uh, it was... Uh, Yesu, uh, AT, AT, I get tongue tied when I say that, ATAS 120A antenna, and it's, and it's specifically uh, geared for the Yesu rigs that have the circuitry to control mm -hmm. it. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work with the others as far as, I'm, as far as I know. I don't think there's any kind of adapter for it. To but uh, I also sent you a, an email with the link straight to the episode. I've got one final email here from Keith G4MSF. Uh, he writes... Uh, hello guys, great show, uh, then everyone tells you that, but it's a fact. I watched the latest show, 20, and perked up when I heard mention of green radios. Uh, I'm an avid collector of old military equipment from World War II through to 1970s vintage, uh, and uh, he uh, gives his website, uh, which shows a small portion of his collection. He also gives a website, uh, which is doubles as a Yahoo group, about... Uh, uh, old wireless sets uh, and it's www.royalsignals.org.uk well this is the perfect lead-in for my next segment uh, Keith uh, recently I was invited to go and do a tour of our signals museum here in Melbourne and uh, this is a museum that is run by uh, a, a friend who's also a, a member of the e uh, Eastern Mountain Districts Radio Club and it basically is a collection of old uh, World War II, uh, Korean War, Vietnamese War, even World War I uh, communications equipment. And it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've uh, prepared this as two 15-minute segments. And now we're going to look at the, and, and this month I should say, we're going to look at the first 15-minute segment uh, and have a, a look at some of this old equipment. I'm sure you're really going to enjoy this. Well, hi everybody and uh, welcome again. I'm here with uh, Major Jim Gordon from the Australian Army Reserve and uh, I'm at the Australian Army Signals Museum <laughs> uh, here in McLeod uh, in, in Victoria, Australia. And uh, Major Jim has uh, agreed to, uh, to show us around. Uh, welcome to Amateur Logic, uh, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Oh, that's great. Look, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the museum and uh, what's housed here and uh, how long you've been here? Okay. The, the museum started out as a collection of equipment back just after World War II at the School of Signals, which was in Balcombe in Victoria. It then moved to Simpson Barracks in 1970. It was housed in the building out the front and moved to this building here, which is an old satellite terminal in 1996. Right. Uh, wrong, 1986. Okay. What kind of gear, and what kind of gear do you actually have uh, uh, housed here? Okay, what, we, what we've got collected here is mainly Army communications equipment, uh, starting out around about the Boer, Boer War with a uh, heliograph, right through to as modern um, a collection of equipment as we can get. Okay, and, and do the radios actually work? Um, quite a few of them work, and if we had time we'd work on a lot of others to get them all working, but uh, some work and some don't. Um, well, I, I can say I had the privilege of uh, having a bit of a tour here last week, and uh, I was in, in quite in, quite impressed. So, let's go around and uh, have a little look around at uh, what you've got here. Okay, yep. Yeah. Okay, Jim, uh, what have we got to, to start with here? Okay, this is an AR7 receiver. 
Um, it is based on an American HRO, a ham radio, um, or loosely based on HRO. It was built in Melbourne, in 380 St Kilda Road, Melbourne, for the Army. The Army had a reception set number one, which is exactly the same, came in silver and black, and uh, they were built mainly for General Douglas MacArthur in World War II, so that he and his soldiers could listen to the Japanese transmissions. Looks a uh, pretty solid piece of equipment, and I note over here it says Kingsley Radio, Melbourne, Australia. Where a lot of these radio, do we have much of a manufacturing industry uh, here in, in Melbourne? Yes, we had a huge industry, and most of these radios were built in Australia, either Melbourne or Sydney. Now, what's this down here uh, we've got? The reception set number four, built by Philips in Sydney. It's a high-frequency communications receiver. Um, and it was uh, built for the army, especially for the army. Okay, it says here that it covers 1.2 to 20 megs. So uh, if uh, any any people pick these up at swap meets, they'd probably be able to use them for uh, like the 160 meter net. Yes, they would. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be all right. And quite a few of the swap meets. Now, what is this here? Okay, this is a reception set number 11, Australian. It was designed by. Um, Bill Butamant, who was a very famous um, person from England, who designed the WS10, the microwave, first microwave multi-channel set, and it was um, also built in Australia. It was um, first um, first used uh, by the Royal Corps of Signals um, when they were deployed to Poland, um, and it was manufactured in Australia by AWA in the early 1940s. So this is obviously a World War II uh, uh, radio as such. Um, it's pretty big and heavy. What sort of power output would it have had? Oh, good question. I have to look at the specs, but it would be only a couple of watts, just a few watts. All, all, this, all this equipment just for a couple of watts. Now, needless to say, there aren't any ICs or transistors inside here, are there? Well, there are these um, integrated circuits with little fires inside them called valves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> valves, right. Well, uh, I, it'd be uh, quite a job, I imagine, changing the valves in, uh, in, in these sets. And, of course, these are all military spec, aren't they? Yes. Mm. So uh, it made to be very, very reliable. Now this looks a, a little bit older. What uh, what have we got here? Well, that's the National HRO um, receiver. Uh, that was um, the one that Kingsley uh, Love and, and Kingsley Radio used um, as a basis for the uh, AR7. Mm -hmm. It was well, basically a, a very expensive um, American ham radio uh, radio. Right, and. Uh, Okay, we'll move over here. Now, this uh, is a cork set, it says. Yes, it's a, a C set or cork set, while a set C Mark II. It was used in the no early 30s, um, and the picture above the radio is some um, uh, militia soldiers um, training with that radio circa 1930. And one of the people is actually very famous, Ham, um, the late uh, Alan Doble, VK3 AMD, when mm -hmm. he was a corporal in about 1930. Yeah, right. Uh, where are the batteries in this? The batteries, uh, these aren't real batteries. These are batteries for a more modern set, but they probably would have sat down the bottom in that shelf and in the side. Right. Again, probably just a couple of watts power? Uh, probably uh, perhaps a watt if you're lucky, I'd say. I, I'm not sure of the specs. I'd have to look them up. Now, this looks a bit, little bit different over here. It says Air Zone Portable Radio. <laughs> You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the Air Zone Portable Radio was just a commercial broadcast radio used for entertainment of the troops. And Air Zone wasn't a company, it was actually a name, and uh, several companies made Air Zone Radio, so it could have been made by one of a number of companies and would have been used uh, as an amenities radio by the troops in World War II. Right. Uh, is that just a, an AM radio or a shortwave radio as well? It would be just AM, I'd say, that one. Just, uh, just AM. <laughs> Okay, Jim, now, what's, what's this rather large uh, radio in three different pieces here? Okay, it's the AT5AR8 combination. Um, this is the transmitter. It was basically an aircraft radio, but it was also used by the Army to communicate with the Air Force, etc., in World War II. Then there's the uh, receivers, effectively receivers, the tuning units, medium frequency, high frequency, and the aerial coupling unit. Now, Jim, we've got the wireless set number 19 Mark II, in brackets, Australia. Yes, that was a set used for communication between vehicles. It had an HF and a VHF um, set, and it also had this interesting aerial variometer for tuning the aerial. Now, by aerial variometer, I, that's like an antenna tuning unit? It's like an antenna tuning unit. It would have had one coil rotating within another coil to, uh, to, to change the coupling. Mm -hmm. Change and the to, inductance. And change, the, change coupling and inductance. Coupling between the two inductors and mm -hmm. change the inductance. Oh. Yeah, this is a wireless set number RC16B. Um, it was used mainly by the Air Force, 
but also the army used it and the coast watchers around New Guinea who worked for the navy who were watching the Japanese movements and reporting back uh, used them. They really liked them. They were quite a good, uh, quite a good transceiver. Now, that's a portable transceiver? Yes, it is portable and it's truly portable because it's uh, quite light. You could carry it. All right. Okay. Um, and, and of course, valve driven and uh, World War II uh, vintage. Yes, they were. They were sort of uh, halfway through World War II and onwards. Uh, do you have the microphone there? Just I'd be interested to have a look at that. Ah, oh. what's the um, a curious little uh, horn at the front here on the uh, on the speaker? Yeah, you normally talk across the microphone, and you just held the microphone like that and talked in the horn. And you could also whisper into that too, so that uh, people wouldn't hear you. To, um, automatic test unit for teletypes. It used to test the circuit and the actual teletype, so you could send um, a message down to the teletype and uh, set it all up and make sure it's all working at the right speed and synchronised, etc. So, in other words, RITI radio teletype uh, was used back in World War Two. Yes, it was, either by wireless or by wire. Oh, OK. And uh, we've got some more RITI equipment over here from the looks of things. Yes, that's some more uh, World War II teletype um, equipment. It's all American and it was used uh, mainly in Korea um, and places like that. Now, Jim, I understand you've got quite a bit of equipment that was used for espionage. Uh, would you like to tell us a, a, a little bit about it? OK, this piece of equipment here, a Type 3 Mark II, is a spy set. It was um, used behind German lines um, in Europe. It was mainly used by British operatives and it's a transmitter-receiver. It had a number of different power sources and it, um, it broke down into small pieces so you could carry it around. But unfortunately the life of a spy wasn't very long, it was probably only about six weeks, so most of the uh, people of these sets were caught and the, the sets were confiscated. Yeah, I recall, I think you were telling me last week that the Germans had a pretty good uh, radio uh, direction finding set up. Yes, yeah, so apart from radio direction finding they also used techniques like when a, uh, a spy was transmitting on AM, they drive around uh, with sirens on on fire engines and ambulances, and if they could hear the siren in the background, they knew that that person was somewhere near that uh, near that uh, vehicle as it went past. So they narrow down where they were very quickly. All right. Now, Jim, uh, last time I was here, you were munching on Anzac bickies, and that looks like a biscuit tin you've got there. Yes, it is, but it doesn't have biscuits in it. What it has in it is this equipment that you can see here, spread out. It's an MRC-1 biscuit tin receiver, again used by spies behind enemy lines. It's a receiver only. It was used for getting messages from their bosses back in London. And, and this is why it's called a biscuit tin receiver. Wow. Because it comes in a biscuit tin. That, that's incredi incredibly small. Does it, um, does it have a pow its own power supply or battery in there? It had batteries. Uh, we haven't got a battery in there, but it had came with batteries and it used a number of different power supplies as you can see from the, the various leads that came with it. And would that have been AM only or Morse code only? It would only? have been um, AM, um, I don't think it was Morse code, I think it was just AM, I don't think it had a BFO. Alright. Oh, it right. was a um, super regen, oh, it's a regen receiver I believe. Right, and it says here... It says that it has reaction and sensitivity so it's a regen receiver. A uh, note from the, uh, uh, the writing here that it says that it ran from uh, 150 kilohertz through to 15 megahertz using four plug-in coil assemblies. Uh, so uh, quite an incredible little uh, radio given the size of uh, valve radios uh, in those days. Yes, and there's the plug-in coil assemblies, yeah. Right. And it's very compact inside and it's before the days of transistors. It's just got small valves in there. Mm -hmm. Right, here's another spy radio. Um, towards the end of the war the, they got smaller and um, lighter and this is a very interesting one because it has a, a, a little, effectively a headphone and an acoustic amplifier which is just a parabolic reflector with a little horn inside it so that you could uh, get maximum sound for minimum power. Right, and uh, again ha has its own batteries? Yes. Or either that would run from uh, various power sources. And it says with the notes that it provided reliable communication for more than 500 miles. Right, and that yeah. would be stored in a suitcase? That's having a small suitcase, yes. Yeah. 13 inches by 9 inches by 4 inches. And of course it's got a little Morse key over. Yes. Over here on the right. Yep. Right, this map here is very interesting because it actually shows the communications across Australia. You've got to remember that in World War II there was very little communications right across the country and a lot of the um, line had to be laid specifically for the war. So a lot of those um, red lines and blue lines and green lines were laid by various army units and they're just basically telephone lines or, or landline to communicate. 
And then from the top of Australia there's a, an undersea cable which ran, ran across to New Guinea. So I ran across um, and provided communications across to New Guinea for a short period of time until it failed. And I believe that cable was reclaimed from um, between um, the mainland and Tasmania and then relayed between the top of Australia and New Guinea. Now for our overseas viewers who may not be uh, familiar too much with the geography of Australia, the top of Australia is actually fairly sparsely inhabited and uh, no doubt we, in World War II there were concerns about the, the Japanese actually coming down and possibly landing boats or uh, uh, dropping bombs on some of the towns up, up the top. I understand, I believe, that uh, Darwin and a couple of other of the northern towns were actually bombed on various occasions. Yes, yes, Darwin was bombed on a number of occasions and quite a few people were killed. Uh, that was suppressed from the public because it was bad for morale. There's bombing right along this part of Australia as well by the Japanese. But although it was sparsely populated, there were thousands and thousands of troops, including American troops, and there are airfields every few miles right around the, the north of Australia. So if you go up there even now, there are remnants of thousands of airfields right across the top of Australia, especially around this area here, around um, Darwin, etc. And needless to say, radio communications would have been absolutely vi vital in that effort. They were, and those two radios we saw before, the FS 6 and the 101 set, they were used for watching right across the top of the Australia here from the coast, watching because the Japanese were just across the sea at New Guinea, so it wasn't very far away. The Japanese were up here. So the, the coast watchers and people watching for the Japanese would have used those radios and communicated back, and the information would have gone down by landline down to the headquarters. Okay, in the south of Australia, we have the capital city of Victoria, which is Melbourne and the capital of New South Wales which is Sydney and most of the war was fought either from Victoria Barracks in Melbourne or Victoria Barracks in Sydney and when General Douglas MacArthur was in Australia he'd either be meeting in Melbourne in a war room there or meeting in Sydney they alternated and he did a lot of his work out of Brisbane up here but the actual planning with the Australian Army with the Australian generals etc was either done in Sydney or Melbourne. Now Jim I understand you've got a bit of a puzzle for our viewers. Yes We've got this Morse key, or this double Morse key, which was donated to the museum by a couple that came through here quite a while ago. It has written on it, uh, Muirhead and Company Limited, and they made a lot of test equipment. It's got a number on it, the number is number 46383, and it's a dual Morse key, as you can see. It has the two keys, and it has two circuits. The, the, the Morse key is wide in parallel, except it just has the two outputs. So um, here's a puzzle for the viewers. Um, tell us what it was used for. It wasn't used for um, two different circuits or anything like that. It had a specific use. See if you can tell us what it was actually used for. It had a very specific use. Wow, Peter, that, that was really good. You know, there was a lot of information in there that I never knew about. It's it's a particular interest to me also because uh, uh, being an Australian, we uh, uh, we, we had uh, quite an involvement in World War Two up in Papua New Guinea, and just looking at the the history, uh, even the bombing of the northern part of Australia, uh, that was uh, quite interesting to learn about that, and also the uh, the links with communications equipment and uh, what the spotters were doing actually up in the northern part of Australia. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, people will be hanging out for the next episode when we'll see the remaining 15 minutes of that footage. Yeah, it was every bit as interesting as the first segment there, so we're looking forward to that again next episode. Definitely. And speaking of next episode, I'm not sure if we've even discussed this with Peter or not. It is summer here in the United States, and uh, a lot of uh, TV production goes into hiatus and shows reruns that time of year mm -hmm. and I think we're going to do the same we're going to knock off for the rest of the summer here since everybody's had a real busy schedule and pick back up resume uh, taping new segments and new shows this fall so in the meantime uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll join us back here again uh, this fall when we'll be bringing more amateur logic television to you so until then uh, this is George and we'll see you next time see you See you later.